We are rangers true under red, white, and blue, and we fight for the right we adore. With our battle cry ringing through the sky, putting freedom on every shore. Well, when the rangers come, there's no beat of a drum, but the flash of a cold steel blade. We'll fight, fight, fight for right, 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 just another famous ranger raid. I got in the boat, when we pulled away, the water was rough and it was cold. And as we came in uh, closer and closer uh, to the shore, that's when we start seeing these 88s or what the hell they were flying over the top of us. You could see them, you know. Well, by that time, I had thrown up <laughs> through my vomit bag. They gave us a bag, you know. And my job was to hook the grappling hook on the rockets to fire the rope up the cliff. When they told us to load up, you know the last thing I said to myself? I didn't say it to myself, I said it to the guy upstairs. I said, dear God, don't let me drown. I want to get in and do what I'm supposed to do. I'm starting to break down. I was the last man off of my boat. Bullets were zipping by, but uh, none hit me, thank God. I got a hold of the rope right in front of me and started up. And I got about two thirds of the way up and uh, this hellacious explosion. The last thing that I saw was, was all of this mud, dirt, and rock coming down the cliff. And then I, I was knocked out. The next thing that I recall was I was buried up to about my waist. And I looked up and, and I could see this German up there and uh, look, looking down like that. And he could have shot me right there if he wanted to, but I guess he figured I was gone, you know. So I looked around for my rifle. No, I had a Tommy gun, and it was some feet away. And I managed to squirm around and finally pull it out. And this fellow was still up there and looking around the other way. And I took a shot at him and pulled the trigger, and it snapped. My gun was clogged up with mud, and there I was. And I remember saying to myself, "Ain't this a hell of a note? Here I am in the damnedest war in history, and I don't have a gun." The first thing about the beach that you notice is there are dead men all over it. And the few that are still quivering are bleeding badly. There are a whole pile, and I actually literally mean a pile of terrified men leaning up against the seawall, one on top of another, not beside each other, but on top of one another, trying to get into the cover there. You see puffs of dust 
as machine gun bullets and rifle bullets are hitting in your area. You hear the smack of bullets as they hit into the breakwaters, and you can hear them and hear them go whang off and as they ricochet, but you can also hear that thump as they hit a rock and scatter fragments of rocks all over the place. You would hear the artillery exploding behind you as they hit the boats on the waterline, the shoreline, and the rifle fire and the uh, machine gun fire was just incessant as it cracked over your heads, as it hit into the breakwaters, as it chewed up the turf, as it banged into the road next to us, and uh, it was one horrible noise after another with a lot of little nasty noises in between. And of course, when the artillery would hit near you, the whole ground would shake. You'd have dust and fragments and things like that come and litter around you. No, it, it was a, a scene from hell. As our ramp went down, I'm the first one off the landing craft. And as I did, I was shot through the side, above my hip, through the muscle on the right side. Fortunately for me, uh, my side was sore and hurt from the shot, but it didn't hit anything important. Bob, my radio man, was next to me on his rope, and we're struggling and about to make the top when Bob says to me, Len, Len, can you help me? And I said, what's wrong? He said, I don't have an ounce of strength left. I can't make it. And it was only about a foot or two to the top of the cliff. And I said, Bob, now that you mention it, I don't think I have an ounce of strength left either uh, to make it, but you gotta hold on. I happened to see Leonard Rubin. He was a very husky fella, and I yelled to him, Rube, Rube, get over there. And I said, Bob can't make it to the top. He's out of strength. Can you help him? With that, Rube throws down his weapon, reaches over, grabs Bob, and he, he is so powerful, my man. He jerked Bob up over the cliff, slung him over, and Bob's going through the air. Uh, in the meantime, I've gained enough strength to get up and I'm standing up there with my submachine gun protecting Bob and Rube and the Germans and Rangers are being shot all around us. As we rushed them, we got to the gun positions that we were assigned and there were no guns. And what was there was these phony poles making it look from the air as if the guns were in those positions. I told my platoon sergeant, Jack Hume, you come with me. And I said, you're not going to go find those guns. They got to be here. Down this one sunken road, and we saw what looked to be wagon wheel tracks. We came to a hedgerow that I had to look over and into an apple orchard, a sunken apple orchard. And there, lo and behold, are the guns of Point the Hawk. When you hear the cry of medic, there's no choice. You don't think, uh, you don't think about anything except you have to go. There's, there's no choice, uh, regardless of what's happening. You tended him and took care of him if possible. If he was dead, he went on to the next guy. Later, it would hit. But at the time, nothing mattered except your job. But later on, Every once in a while I think of a Sergeant Otto in F Company, who I got along with very well and liked. He was on the top a very short time when he was 
hit in the belly. And the wounds, these wounds, like that, took just simply a hole in the abdomen. And that nobody paid much attention to it. I mean, they, if it, they didn't know any better, didn't pay much attention to it, just get to the medics and they'd take care of it. We had him in the aid station, what we made into an aid station. Well, I got him and I saw what it was and insisted he lie down. Typical of, of a wound of that sort is that the bullet will go in and sometimes it'll go all the way through and it'll tumble and do extensive damage. The pain is enormous. We kept him under as much as we could with morphine. And eventually, eventually when we were relieved, of course, he was evacuated, but he died aboard ship. But I think of him every once in a while as I remember him because I, I, we were friends. And these are men who live in your memory. But all this, the personalities, uh, become frozen. They, know, they never develop. The people never develop. They're stopped in time and place. These were living human beings. Some of them a little nutty, some of them irritating. All of them were real. And the sacrifice is of all of these characteristics, all of this personality. All of the futures gone. All of the, all of the futures gone.